anytime there's a dip, there's going to be, you know, a peak at some point. So the question is, are you making the deposits now and planting the seeds now so that when things do get better, you'll be better than ever? I mean, that's the only option we have. All right, I'm, fan yeah, I'm fantastic. It's great to be with you all. Yeah, absolutely. Thank <laughs> Appreciate you. Appreciate it, man. Tell, Alan, tell us a little bit. Give us that 60-second bio of who Alan is. It'll probably be shorter than 60 seconds. So basketball, my wife. Was my, basketball was my first love. I fell in love with the game at five years old. And here, four decades later, uh, basketball is still a major pillar of my life. And I spent the first third of my life as a very dedicated basketball player. Uh, over that time, I started to develop an equal love for performance training, strength and conditioning, nutrition, mindset. So I decided to become a basketball performance coach when I was done playing in college. I did that for the next 15 years of my life. And then in my current iteration, I'm a keynote speaker and author. But I take all of the lessons that I've learned through the game's best players and coaches, and I show folks how to apply those to their own lives and their own businesses. And uh Absolutely love what I do. Very grateful for an opportunity to do it. And I'm excited for a fun chat with you guys. Yeah, we're, we're excited on that. And I want to go I want to go back. You were leaving college and, and I kind of heard this on the other shows like you. You had a, you had this probably idea that you knew you weren't going to go past college level of, of playing ball. Correct. Yes. Yeah, that was very obvious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so from that, me too. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was uh, I was no Stephon Curry, so it was uh, yeah. yeah. It was I mean, clear, it was yeah. clear that I was going to have to find something else to do. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's a normal thing here. I just messed I messed names up. That's what I, I do. love it, brother. Um, 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 so Stefan, I apologize. And <laughs> and so as you're as you're winding up your college career, um, with maybe at, at one time maybe hopes that you were going to make it, how did you transition into that next phase? Right. So that you know you you had to probably have a mental mind shift on that as well. The single best piece of advice I've ever received to this day, I was thankful to receive in middle school, and I had a coach tell me that the key to being successful, the key to being a high performer, the key to being fulfilled is to find your strength zone. And he said, your strength zone is finding what it is that you love, something you're very passionate about and finding what it is that you're naturally pretty good at, where your natural talents lie and find where those two things intersect. Yeah. And wherever those two points intersect, that is your strength zone. And the more time and effort and heart and soul and love you can spend in your strength zone, the more likely you are to, to, again, be successful, be fulfilled, be happy, uh, perform at a high level. Um, and I've stayed true to that my entire life. I mean, as I mentioned, uh, that intersection was as a basketball player when I was younger, when I realized that I did not have the requisite talent to play at the next level. I needed to find something else that I was very passionate about, but had some skill in. And, and it happened to be being a coach, uh, being a teacher, being someone that could pour into others from a performance standpoint. So um, to me, as long as I can navigate life and, and remain in that strength zone, while of course, stepping outside and leaving my comfort zone to grow and develop and evolve. But if I can always stay in that strength zone of something I'm passionate about and something I'm naturally pretty good at, life tends to work out. And for me, that next iteration was just as obvious as could be. It needed to be in the basketball training space because that combined my original love of the game of basketball with this newfound love of strength, conditioning, mindset, nutrition, and so forth. Man, that is that is awesome. I, I, I love that ideology and that, that story, and I appreciate you sharing that. Um, that is, there's a great thought exercise on doing that exact same thing. In uh, I can't, the author escapes me, but the book is The Art of Impossible, uh, mm -hmm. and a really, really good thought exercise on 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 finding those two alignments, right? Your passions and your strengths. Um, I think for as we apply, you know, some of the things that maybe you've encountered in, in making that transition from player to performance coach. I think that actually a lot of maybe your journey is probably relevant to you know what we do in real estate and the the way that I'm thinking about this now is like. I feel like a lot of real estate professionals feel very stuck right now. Like just, what do I do next? It's almost like this reset in a sense of like what worked before maybe doesn't work as well now. What, what you had to do before to be successful is not really the same thing you need to do now. And I feel like a lot of real estate professionals are just kind of going like, what what is the thing that I need to do to be successful and how do I go about doing that? And I think where it's relevant to your journey is like transitioning from, I'm 
you know, still an elite basketball player. Playing at even the college level means you're an elite basketball player. To, you know, my passion is basketball, and 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 my skill, or you know, finding that alignment between passion and skill, right? Then what do you do? How do you? What was the step to go? Okay, now I'm going to become or get in the space of performance coaching. What was like? What was like the the next week after you like had this realization of like, okay, now I need to take action and actually do something about this, like? What are the what are what was that part of the process like? I feel like a lot of times we have this clear, clearer ideology around here's what I want to accomplish, but then it's like how do you go about doing that? How do you transition from elite level basketball player and take the first steps towards performance coach, very 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 highly regarded performance coach? Like what are those first steps? Well, for me, there was kind of a slow build up and a slow ramp up. So I sure. played at Elon University, which is a very small school in North Carolina. I mean, it's it's a, it's a mid major school, mm-hmm. and, and I was not one of the main rotation players at Elon. So you know, when you're uh, kind of a role player or a bench player at a small school, uh, especially in the early '90s, you know, based on my age, the writing was on the wall that I was not going to be a professional player. So it wasn't this cold bucket of ice water on my head. Sure. I had four years, or in my case, four and a half years to kind of figure out what I wanted to do next. Um, and, you know, uh, because I had identified as being a basketball player for my entire life up until that point, I had to do some soul searching and I had to have some introspection and, and increase my self-awareness and came to the conclusion, you know, uh, b- basketball is what I did. It's not who I was. Mm-hmm. And, and that's really an important distinction for everybody to make. I mean, even folks, you know, in the um, in any area of real estate, you know, um, let's just say selling homes, for example, that's what you do, but your greater mission and purpose goes well above and beyond that. That's just simply a vehicle for you to be of service to others. And that might be the lane that you've chosen. And, and there's tremendous purpose in that lane, but it's always important to kind of look at your higher self and, and don't relegate yourself to just what it is that you do. Um, I mean, at present, I'm a keynote speaker. But that's really just the vehicle for me to get the larger message out there and to have a, a positive impact on others and and to share a message. That's just the platform that I use. So um, that's the first part is, is having the introspection and the self-awareness to really figure out what your ultimate you know purpose is. And I know that word's thrown around a lot. Um, you know, on a on a macro level, there's a a corporate group that I've seen does this brilliantly, and that's uh, DHL, uh, the International oh, yeah. Shipping and Logistics mm-hmm. Goliath, and you know their their tagline, their their purpose and, and mantra, if you will, is uh, we don't deliver brown boxes, we deliver promises, and that's not just a sexy tagline. There's a lot of depth to that. They make sure that every single person on their team, and their team has hundreds of thousands of team members, remembers that yeah, we might be delivering brown boxes. But we're so much more than that. And they remind folks that, in essence, you're not really delivering a brown box. You're delivering a kid's birthday present. You know, you're not delivering a brown box. You're delivering a future bride's wedding dress. You're not just delivering a brown box. You're delivering somebody's medicine that they need to live. So they make sure that everybody stays connected to their higher purpose of what it is that they do. And, you know, I think um, anytime there's, kind of a downtick in the economy or certain industries are feeling that shakeup, it's important for folks in that space, and in this case, the real estate space, to stay connected to their higher purpose and vision of what they do. So even if homes aren't selling at the rate they were selling before, you can still find ways to be of service and to add value. And and if you really go a few layers deeper, you know, selling somebody a home, you, you might be selling them a tangible home, but what is it that you're actually selling them? You know, you're you're selling them security. You're selling them a place to make memories. You're selling them a place to build a family. You're sell- like you're doing so much more than what it just says kind of on your LinkedIn bio line. And I think connecting to that is what's most important. And for me, no matter what it is I'm doing in any iteration of my life, I have to make sure that I'm staying connected to that in order to show up as my best self and make a maximum contribution. That makes a lot of sense to me because then when you have to pivot how you achieve that higher purpose, you're more so positioned to do so rather than be like <clears throat> analysis paralysis or even imposter syndrome, um, I, just to to stay relevant because then you're not so stuck on the, the goal or how I get there, but more of like the actual why of what's driving me. But I wanna ask, because you touched on self-awareness, 
some of us in this room consider ourselves very self-aware and we are around a lot of people who we know are not. <laughs> so how do you help someone gain that? Like, have you, with any of the players that you have worked with or coached, how do you help someone get that, that skill in themselves so that they can continue to better themselves, if that makes sense? It absolutely does. And I'm glad we're going in this direction. Well, as with most things, it starts with a humility. It starts with an acknowledgement that I, as a human being, um, am going to have blind spots. I mean, even sitting here right now, uh, I know that I have blind spots. Now, I don't know what they are. That's why they're blind spots. But I'm very strategic in insulating myself with a circle of people that care enough about me to tell me my blind spots and to, to share these things from their angles and their perspectives uh, that can help. And I know this sounds very counterintuitive, but one of the ways to increase self-awareness is to recruit the people closest to us that know us the best so that they can, they can help. Um, you know, really self-awareness needs, means there is an alignment between the way I see myself and evaluate myself and the way others perceive me and the way the outer world perceives me. And this has nothing to do with trying to pander for someone's affection or adoration or approval, but it's just making sure that there's an alignment and how I would rate myself in any area of my life is that congruent with how other people would rate me. And if the answer is yes, then you usually have a fairly high sense of self. If there's a massive disconnect between the way I view myself and the way the world views me, that means I have low self-awareness. So, you know, if, if in college, if I would have told myself over and over, I am a bona fide NBA player, I am an unbelievable world-class basketball player, well, very quickly I would have been put in check because those that make those evaluations and scouts in the NBA would say, you are delusional, you're not anywhere close to an NBA player. And that would just simply mean that I have lack of self-awareness. Thankfully, I had the awareness to know it's not in the cards for me to be a professional player, but I could be a pretty good coach if I work on these skill sets. So this is the path I'm going to take. So, so you need to be willing time to self-awareness comes into asking others for their their help. But it, it's not just asking random people. It's it's not soliciting acquaintances from Facebook. It's the people that that know you. Uh, people that you trust, people that you know love you and want to see you successful and and, and fulfilled. Um, so you've got to keep that circle fairly tight. What a what a beautiful distinction. Because for me, for years, I actually use self awareness as a crutch, right? Because I actually think you can be so self aware and so willing to be transparent that people think because you're so willing to be transparent, this guy just must be on another level of self awareness. Then there's no action behind it. There's no actual change. You're just addicted to the transparency of self-awareness, right? <laughs> and you're not actually doing anything to change it. You're just kind of get, and this is where the social media aspect comes in. Everybody's like, oh, look at this person being so vulnerable. And then behind the scenes, you're still doing the exact same thing and the exact same behaviors. What has been your advice to people who have that? Because I, 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 like you, love these types of conversations that have that level of self-awareness. Who do you recommend that they speak to to get that let's say they don't have a group of people that they trust or they feel they can go to how do you really start diving deep on that because for me it took my world getting a lot smaller and having to have a lot of conversations that candidly hurt my feelings um, before i could get to a level of understanding that my self-awareness was bullshit without real action to change behind it what do you do with somebody who's stuck in that phase because i was there for years um and it wasn't fun <laughs> No, it's, it's definitely not. I mean, all I can share is through my own personal journey. The real conduit for me was, um, was therapy. Um, yeah. I, I've been divorced now therapy. for eight years. And, and when I first started going, uh, the, the process of getting divorced, I went in to see a therapist and that's what changed everything for me because here this professional is that is completely unbiased. I mean, they're just getting to know me and my story and my journey. And, uh, she was holding me highly accountable and she made me aware of a lot of things that I was not aware of at that time. And, you know, I was also at a time in my life um, where I was deflecting accountability. I was constantly blaming and complaining and making excuses. You know, my answer to the reason the marriage wasn't working was because she wasn't doing what she was supposed to do. And I wasn't holding myself accountable to where I was negligent or where I was com complicit in creating you know, the dissolution of the, the relationship. And the therapist is the one that would shine that light on and say, we don't need to talk about anybody else. Like we just need to talk about you. And she was the one that got me on that path of self-awareness. And then once it was kind of like these blinders were being taken off um, and it was, it was painful. It was uncomfortable. 
Um, you know, it, it definitely uh, gave me several slices of humble pie to start to realize uh, almost all of this was my own doing. And uh, yeah, but that's, that's what it started. So she was kind of the spark. But then once I realized that being more aware, you know, kind of takes the shackles off and allows you to grow and evolve and, and improve, um, you know, then, then I was hooked. And it's self-awareness is, is also an interesting one because to me, I don't believe it's an ending destination. I think it is a continual process and it will ebb and flow. I mean, even now in present time, there are certain times where I'm simply more in tune with my environment and I'm more aware than other times. There are some times in my life where I have more blind spots than other times. It's, it's kind of like physical fitness. You know, you, you can't put your flag on the ground and announce to the world, I'm physically fit and then stop eating well and stop exercising and stop doing all of those things because pretty soon you'll no longer be physically fit. It's the same thing with self-awareness. You, you can't claim, Hey everyone, I'm self-aware and then stop doing the daily work that is required to be self-aware because that will, it will quickly evade you. So you're saying we can't just liver king it and tell everybody that we're like we're not using not using gear and then just be geared up all day. <laughs> I love that. like that's such a a good you know almost answer kind of my question in a little bit of the way is like self awareness is only awareness of yourself in that particular moment. We were literally just having a conversation about this earlier about just the growth of human beings and how you're never the same person for more than one moment in time, right? And, and then you extrapolate that over years. And self-awareness will continue to evade you if if you feel like it's like the more you're sure that you are who you are, the less likely you are to retain that. Right. Because you're never the same person for more than that moment in time. I, I wonder, though, how that is where I think people kind of struggle sometimes, with like the longevity of success. When you talk about like the winning mindset, mm -hmm. you know, what what is it about the balance between the humility of self-awareness and the the understanding of the growth that one needs to go through to get to where they're going and what i believe is like the fierce confidence that you need to have to actually accomplish the things that you set out to accomplish right like there's humility of being small like i know who i am and i can't do that right and then there's like a fierce confidence in i know who i am and i can do that but then like when does that bleed over to i'm so sure of myself that now I've lost my own self-awareness. Like, where is the balance between self-awareness and the confidence you need to have to keep pushing forward towards whatever it is you're trying to accomplish without just becoming, you know, like we know with athletes. Like, we know athletes that are massively overconfident for what they've accomplished, right? Like, where is that balance? Well, I, I'm glad you went in this direction as well. There will always be a dance between between confidence and humility. And uh, if you look at it on the spectrum, you have someone here that has all confidence and absolutely zero humility. They're borderline arrogant or narcissistic. That's going to create some serious problems. If you go all the way to the other side, uh, someone that has all humility but no confidence, they're going to be they're going to be meek. They're not you know they're they're not going to be anywhere close to being able to leave the type of impact that they're capable of. Uh, so we want to find a balance in between. And I think it's somewhat different for each individual. Uh, some of it has to do with our, our personality and our temperament. Uh, but I also don't think it's static. I think we'll kind of move on that scale um, but when needed. But both are required. Uh, I'm a huge believer that confidence needs to be earned. Uh, and it's earned primarily during the unseen hours by putting in the reps of whatever it is that you're trying to be good in. Um, so comp you earn the right to be confident. Uh, the reason, uh, and we'll just make this easy, Steph Curry is so uh, confident <laughs> is because he puts in so many hours when no one else is watching. Yeah. I mean, the, the lengths that, that he goes through to work on his craft and to work on his shot um, is, is just, it's beyond what most people can comprehend. So when he gets on the court and he believes every shot he take is, takes is going in, he's earned the right to be that confidence. He's not just making yeah. it up and it's definitely not a fake it till you make it. He has absolutely earned that right. But what keeps him as one of the world-class you know, athletes of all time is he, he blends that with humility and humility to the point that he stays open to feedback uh, he stays open to being coached and having people share with him his blind spots. But most importantly, he has the humility to acknowledge that no matter how good he gets, he can still get better. And that's all that matters to him. 
uh, is that he knows he still has room for improvement. Now, when you get to his level uh, or level of some of the other folks that you've mentioned, you know, the, the room for improvement is rather thin because these guys have already come fairly close to maxing out their potential. So they're, they're incredibly motivated, inspired by very tiny micro improvements, you know, systematic, incremental, progressive improvement. You know, a guy like Stephen Curry is not going to make huge sweeping gains in an NBA offseason. He's going to make one or two percent gains in one or two different areas of his game each offseason. But when you stack that year after year or decade after decade in the case of somebody like a LeBron James or a Tom Brady, and that's why you see these guys able to sustain excellence. So this dance between confidence and humility, uh, which takes very high self-awareness, um, is vital. And it's it's one that it's easy to misstep. And, and we all make those missteps. You know, there'll be times where we could probably use a little more confidence and a little less humility. And then there's certainly times where the reverse is true. So that's where the self-awareness piece comes in, is being able to evaluate in real time and take in real time feedback on how we're doing in any given situation. I like that you said that because sometimes that confidence will take you to a decision that maybe you shouldn't have made. And sometimes that over humbleness will take you to a decision that you should have made, but you didn't act on. I'm going to fanboy out just for a little a second because you're talking about Curry. And, and I know somebody else that you coach is, I don't know them, but you know, read the bio about, <laughs> but I've heard of about, them. about, about, about Kobe and, and that kind of conversation. That's somebody to me that from afar was all humble or was all confidence, right? And very humble person, I'm sure, in his personal life around things. But I mean, you just talk about, you know, the stories are endless. How do I mean, what does that look like behind the scenes with somebody who who obviously has all the ability, one of the greatest ever that's indisputable, but also like just seems like there wasn't an ounce of him that wasn't sure of himself in every second. I mean, could you just talk about that relationship and experience a little bit? Well, sure. And, and to put into context, I only had a chance to meet and, and, and be around Kobe on a few different occasions. So I did not know There's him. A few more than me. So I'd love to hear it. <laughs> but but I, I certainly <laughs> but I certainly know that that, you know, with a guy like that. Now, there's a couple areas that we can look at confidence and humility. I think even to his own admission, um, he probably could have leaned in with a little more humility and grace and compassion in the way that he dealt with teammates. Sure. But he had very high humility for himself back to my original definition of, you know, his goal was to be the greatest that ever played. And no matter what he accomplished, no matter how many points he scored, all-star games he made or money he made, he still knew he had to improve, which is why he had that relentless pursuit of greatness during some pretty intense unseen hours. Um, but that humility is what allowed him to, to know that he could still get better. But yes, to the outside world, to opponents, to teammates, he skewed heavily towards confident, high confidence and lower humility. So everybody's got to find that balance. Um, and, and it's different in, in different times. Um, with a guy like Kobe, you know, he, he readily acknowledged that his goal was to be the best. Mm -hmm. um, see, I'm not wired that way. I'm wired differently. I, I don't really have any desire to be the best. I have a high, a high inspiration and motivation to be my best, and, and they're slightly different. Um, I do the best I can to not play the comparison game in different areas of my life. And it's not easy to do because we live in a culture, and especially with social media, that I think is designed to get us to play the comparison game. Um, but I try not to play that. You know, I'm, There's not an ounce of me that is ever worried about if I'm the best keynote speaker. That's for other people to decide. All I'm worried about is, am I the best that I'm capable of? And am I doing my best to deliver for the audiences that I speak to? And, and as long as I feel that I'm doing that and progressively getting better at that, because you better believe I'm a better keynote speaker today than I was one, three, five years ago. Yeah. And I can promise you guys, if you have me on your show a year from now, I'll be an even better speaker then than I am book today. <laughs> that's the goal. So yeah, yeah, let's go ahead and book it. Because that's the goal is, is continual, systematic, progressive, incremental improvement. And that's what mo motivates me and drives me is can I be better than yesterday is way more important than am I better than you. And, I, and everybody fired differently. I'm sorry. I want. I, we have a little delay. I didn't mean to interrupt you. We have a. Little, I want to piggyback off of that because where does where does the balance come in 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 life with that? Right. Like I'm not necessarily a fan of work life balance because I don't think it exists. Right. But like, like just in general with these people who are high achievers, even people in this room, people who are successful at whatever they do, 
how do you as a coach and a speaker really speak to the balance of, because that can get really out of whack really quick. And when you start talking about, you know, you, you reference your divorce, I, I've, I'm divorced and it was solely because of, not solely, it's because of a lot of reasons, but my, <laughs> my, career, my, my, my career factored into that in a high way. And, and I still struggle to find that balance, even when I'm not at work to, to rein some of that stuff in. How do you address that as a, as a coach, as somebody who helps people produce at a higher level? Because if your life falls apart, business is going to fall apart too. So to add on to that, I wanted to know about setting boundaries specifically because Personally, I view someone who's a really high achiever, they tend to have boundaries, they tend to be able to protect their personal time, and it's without fear of losing business, and you're so good that the people, I don't wanna say they're gonna wait for you, but they're gonna respect it and work within the schedule because it's so worth it to work for you. But like, how do you set those and not cost yourself business or a lot of y'all got divorced? <laughs> yeah, I think three of the four in this, actually, all of you know, the men. All the men on this <laughs> on this podcast have been divorced. <laughs> we have three of us and one guy who met his wife in kindergarten. <laughs> in, in, let me take one step back and just say, because this is a really important an important distinction. Everything that we've discussed so far, everything that I imagine we'll discuss in the rest of this conversation, everything I share on stage and everything I share on page is very basic in principle. I'm a simple guy. I believe in the fundamentals. I believe in the basics, but not a single thing that I've shared here or will share or on stage or on page is easy to do. And basic and easy do not mean the same thing. Uh, people often use those words as if they're synonymous, but they're not. They don't mean the same thing. And the reason I say that is, you know, the, the questions you guys are asking, the answers are very basic and a matter of fact but actually implementing this stuff in every single day life is really challenging to do. And none of this stuff that I'm sharing am I coming from a place of mastery. Um, I'm happy and very proud of the progress that I've made in my life, especially over the last several years in particular. Um, but I don't have all of this stuff figured out. And this, whatever we wanna call it, whether you wanna call it work-life balance or work-life harmony or work-life flow or work-life integration, whatever, it's all under the umbrella of life. I try not to compartmentalize too much. You know, for me, um, I tend to think and I live by certain quotes that just make things easier for me to process. And I've always been a believer, um, and I don't know who said this originally, or I give them proper attribution, but how you do anything is how you do everything. And for me, I strive to be fully present in all areas of my life. I strive for a high standard of excellence in every area of my life. So whether it's being a father to my three children or it's the next keynote that I'm going to give, I want to do the best job that I'm capable of. And I want to give either one of those my full self, my full attention and my full presence. So for me, when it comes to work-life balance or flow or harmony, I don't worry so much about um, the equality of numbers or time but just am I giving everything I have to whatever I said I was going to? And there are some times in my life as a speaker um, that I'm busier, I'm on the road more, I'm traveling more, and I'm pouring a lot more into my audiences. Um, and there's other times that are slightly slower and I have more time at home and can spend more time with my family. But even if I'm only gonna get a limited amount of time with my children, I wanna make sure that that limited amount of time is super high quality, that it's not distracted, I'm not, like I am there, in, in mind, body, and spirit. So for me, that's where it starts. But then it also goes back to, we have to get crystal clear on our core values. We have to get crystal clear on what it is that we believe. And then we need to make sure we're designing our life and our behaviors to be in alignment with that. Man, so, that so, you know, hard. my own uh, self-care, my physical, mental, and emotional wellness is something that is really, really important to me. Because I'm of the belief that the only way I can be a, an, an elite level father or an elite level keynote speaker is if I'm taking care of myself. So I have very strict boundaries for my own physical fitness and wellness routines about when I go to bed at night, about eating clean, about making sure that I'm consuming, reading, watching and listening to stuff that is that is, uh, you know, educating me, that is inspiring me. I do the best I can to siphon off all of the noise, all of the negativity, all of the gossip. Um, I believe in being informed for sure, but I don't spend just hours and hours listening to negativity. It, it just, it, it's not good for me personally. So yes, I put strict boundaries in place. 
Will you elaborate on some of your routines, like your morning routine, your evening routine? Mm -hmm. Be happy set you to. up for success. Yeah, and I'm glad that you 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 brought up evening routine because that one's just as important as morning routine. Although morning routine tends to get you know all of the headlines and is what's talked about more on social media, but it's kind of like the chicken and the egg. You know what comes before your morning routine? Well, it's the previous night's evening yeah. routine. And I know it's it's not a super sexy topic, and you're not going to get a lot of views or sell a lot of books, but sleep is really, really important, especially as we get older. I mean, you know, people are always looking for all of these different life hacks and biohacks to improve performance. Just prioritizing sleep will do more for you than just about anything else you can do. So yeah, I, I create kind of what I call a wind down routine so that every night I put myself in a position to get the best sleep that I can. Um, and that doesn't always work. That's the other part about process versus outcome. Um, and I, I'm sure we'll dive into this a, a little bit deeper, especially when we start talking about some real estate specific stuff. But we, we have to be very careful about tethering and holding on too tightly to outcomes. I'm much more of a guy that believes in, in processes. So, you know, for me, part of my wind down routine, and you don't hear very many motivational spe speakers say this, is, you know, I watch something mindless on Netflix uh, or Hulu before I go to bed because it allows me to disengage my mind. It allows me to relax. I usually err towards watching something uh, of comedic in nature, so it gets me to laugh. But I just get something that allows me to turn my brain off from what I've been thinking about all day. Um, I mean, if you really want to get specific, I, I wear some blue blocker uh, oh, glasses so that I'm, I'm not emitting the blue rays. Uh, you know, I make sure that I don't eat anything for about two to three hours before I go to bed. Um, you know, there's there's different systems I put in place, but my goal is to make sure that I get a good night's sleep. And then from a morning routine standpoint, um, every single day when I wake up, I try to do three things before I technically start my work. Uh, I try to engage my mind, my body, and my heart. So, and when I say heart, I'm talking more from an emotional standpoint. Um, so maybe I'll read, watch, or listen to something that's inspirational or motivational. Uh, maybe I'll do some some yoga pose uh, stretches, or maybe I'll go for a run or lift some weights. Uh, maybe I'll, you know, I just want to do something that kind of gets me going before I start to actually tackle the day. Uh, but then part of my evening routine the night before is laying out a plan for what I'm trying to accomplish the next day. So while I'm sleeping, my subconscious mind can go to work for me um, to allow me to be as efficient as I can. So one thing I'll say about morning and evening routines is I, I think there's kind of this purveying myth out there that there is a perfect morning routine or that here's a morning routine that all high achievers should follow. And I don't believe that. I, I think there's a massive variance and what works for me may not work for each of you. It may not work for your audience. Uh, what's most important is each person, through some self-awareness and some trial and error, figures out the rhythm that works best for them. And, and it'll also change in every stage of life. I mean, if, if someone listening to this right now is a single parent with a newborn, that's going to put some limitations on what you can do from a morning and evening routine standpoint compared to someone that's in their 20s who's single that is completely unfettered. That's also different than someone that's in their mid fifties whose kids are grown. Like all these different stages, we have to be able to adapt and evolve and figure out what's best for us now at this time. So just like I told you all, you know, that, that a year from now, I'll be a better keynote speaker than I am today. And I'm better today than I was a year ago. Same thing with my morning and evening routine. It's evolved over the last couple of years and it will continue to evolve for the next couple. I just want to make sure that I'm always doing what puts me in a position to show up consistently as my best self and making maximum contribution to everyone and everything around me. I love that, man. And, and, and I appreciate you sharing that so much because I, I am very much a routine guy. I know that a lot of us are around here as well. And the, the thing that you really focus in on that I want to almost even just kind of dive a little deeper on is, is you know, you're going to have to find the routine within the limitations that work for you. We have this thing, because I think that goes both ways. We have this thing where I think for like books or, you know, speakers, even keynotes or things that we, you know, coaching programs, things like for so much of it, like they tell you, you got to do things a certain way. Um, Hal Elrod's like a good friend to some of the people on this show. Really great dude. Love his books, right? Like, um, and 
I, I know that people like he will even probably say he only does the miracle morning like eighty percent of the time. That's a win for him, right? Because there's like he's a super busy guy, right? Like it's really hard to do all of that every single day. And then you extrapolate that to like whatever um, you know, like whatever your limitations are. You have kids, you've got, you know, you're going to school and trying to get your masters and doing a full time job on there's like a lot going on. And I think that we have so much like almost a perverse attraction to like, you've got to do X, Y, and Z or you're kind of a piece of shit, right? <laughs> then we also have like this perverse like cop out to like, I can't do all of that, so I'm going to do none of it. And I think that that's such an insightful point is like, just because you can't do 100% of one, you should never try to do that. It's called habit stacking for a reason, right? If, if you think that like you should compare yourself to like, Everything that like a really dialed in routine, like a Stephen Curry does or whatever on day one, you're setting yourself up for failure. That would be like me being like, all right, I'm going to start working out again and I need to look like The Rock, right? Like, no, he gets paid to look like The Rock. That's why he, he works out a lot, right? But then we have this thing where like, well, if I can't look like The Rock, I'm not going to work out at all, right? Where it's like, if I can't wake up at four o'clock in the morning because X, Y, and Z is going on then I'm just not going to have a routine at all. Where it's like, you've got to find the thing that works for you. You can't not do anything, even if you can't do everything. And I think that just mm -hmm. making, like you said, incremental steps in the right direction, extrapolated over a period of years, oh my gosh, what a different person you'll become. I think we let ourselves off the hook so much because we can't do everything. But we also have this really perverse like improvement culture where like if you don't do everything, you might as well not even show up, bro. Like you're not you're not top G, bro, <laughs> or whatever oh, it is. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's so much gold in what you just shared there, and we do tend to live in a world that plays on the ends and plays on the extremes. And yeah, a, a little bit is better than nothing yeah. in, in any way, shape, or form. And you know, even back to the morning routines. I mean, for me. I have different morning routines. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm amicably divorced. Uh, I have 13 year old twin sons and I have an almost 11 year old daughter. So my kids are with me, you know, roughly half of the time. I have a different morning routine when my kids are with me sure. than when I'm by myself. Uh, I have a different morning routine when I'm traveling somewhere and I'm going to be speaking that day than I do. So I've created some different systems and morning routines and processes even within the, the same current life that I'm living okay. just based on those circumstances. And, you know, it's one of the biggest mistakes we can make. And I think this is where you're going with this. And it was perfect is we allow ourselves to get stifled by perfection. Uh, I threw perfection out the window years ago, which was yeah. convenient to do because I wasn't anywhere close to it in any area of my life. <laughs> yeah, that's the <laughs> easiest thing to get rid of. <laughs> yeah. I threw perfection out the window and instead what drives me is progress. Uh, and that's why I can say with a huge smile, but a tremendous amount of humility and gratefulness that I'm proud of the progress I've made. And I'm very proud of the path that I'm on. And one of the things I want to make sure your, your listeners know is don't get consumed with where you are at this moment. Focus much more on the direction at which you're headed. And as long as that arrow is pointed forward or pointed up, whichever term you like better, then just know that you're moving in the right direction. And don't worry if right now, if you're saying to yourself, oh my gosh, I am a train wreck. My morning routine is awful. First and foremost, give yourself some grace and some space and some self-compassion and some kindness. Like it's okay. You're not alone. Uh, second thing you need to do is be prepared to exercise some patience and just realize that by tomorrow morning, you are not going to have the perfect ideal morning routine. It is a process. But just ask yourself, can you just do one or two things tomorrow morning, even for just five or six minutes that will kind of fill your bucket and help your morning routine? I mean, even just that one change tomorrow morning will mean tomorrow morning's morning routine was a little bit better than today's. And that's going to start creating some of that momentum. Uh, an exercise I have people do all of the time, and um, it, it's, it's pretty rudimentary, but it's very powerful if someone's willing to do it is you just take out a piece of paper and you draw a vertical line down the middle. On the left side of the paper, you come up with an exhaustive list of the things that I'll just say, fill your bucket, mm -hmm. mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, if that's appropriate to you. But what are the things that light you up? The things that give you energy, the things that make you smile, the things you enjoy doing, the things that nourish your soul. I mean, you, you use whatever description you want, but come up with a list of those things. Uh, it could be taking a yoga class or hopping on your Peloton bike 
or taking your dog for a walk. Uh, it could be enjoying the stillness of the morning while you sip some coffee. It could be listening to a podcast or watching a documentary. It could be meditation. It could be prayer. Uh, it could be conversation with a loved one. But come up with a list of the things that just make you feel alive and make you excited. On the other side of the paper, on the other side of that line, I just want you to write down how you've been spending the bookends of your day. You know, what it is we're talking yeah. about now, your morning and your evening routine. More specifically, what do you normally do the first 60 minutes after your eyes open in the morning? And what do you normally do the 60 minutes before your eyes shut at night? And just write those things down. Now, don't write down what you think you should be doing or what people on Facebook are doing. Write down what you've been doing. And then just compare the two sides of the paper and the two notes and ask yourself one of the most important questions you can ask yourself when it comes to improving performance. And that is, am I doing the things I know I need to do to fill my bucket and be my best self? Mm -hmm. And even, even those listening right now that are very high performers and high achievers, if you do this with some honesty and some vulnerability, you'll most likely start to uncover what's called a performance gap. And a performance gap is the gap between what we know we should do to be our best self and what we're actually doing. And the key to improving performance and improving fulfillment and enjoyment of life is to slowly close that gap, is to start taking things from the left side of the paper and start sprinkling them into your morning and evening routine. And even if you're just doing that for 10, 15, 20 minutes on the bookends of your day, it will make a radical shift in how you show up in your energy level, in your optimism, uh, depending on what those things are, in your physical fitness, all of yeah. those things. So if someone's willing to do that kind of recalibration, reset exercise, it can be a game changer. And like I said, don't plan on changing everything by Tuesday morning. Just take a little bit of what's on the left side and sprinkle it in for 10 minutes on the right side and you'll start to see it makes a difference. And then once you start generating that momentum, nothing's going to stop yeah. you at that point. That's so, just so, such a, no, no, no. no yeah. I was just gonna, like, this, this is, just gonna say, like, how many people's left side do you think has watched 327 TikToks in a row? Yeah. You don't put that. We never put the things we yeah. actually do. It's yeah. such well, a good if you, awareness. Like, calibrate test. that to what's actually on your calendar, how you're spending your time. That's a whole other yeah. level up in awareness. So, so Alan, there's two two questions I have. First off, is Brian? Does Brian ask the longest questions that you've ever been a part of on a podcast? And then you don't know whether it's a question or did he answer it? So, you know, I get that a lot. Um, <laughs> I love um, it. But on the performance gap, so like if we were to take this as, a, you know, getting into mindset, there's people out there like, oh, yeah, 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 that, you know, that it's kind of like voodoo magic to some people, right? To, to help me become a better business person or a better salesperson to make more money. And what would be, you know, I look at that and, and I, if we replay this, this podcast, there's so much nuggets that we could take out that actually applies to business and not just personal lives. So would that performance gap um, um, test, would that be something that can be applied to, to a real estate salesperson, which, because we wake up every day unemployed. Every mm -hmm. day we wake up, we're unemployed. You know, the news out there is, is you know, banks are failing. Interest rates are all time high. We have inflation that we can't get under control. The we're losing the the dominance as a U.S. superpower. And if you go down that rabbit hole, what's the point of even working, right? So is is the performance gap test the way that we can run that metric to to improve ourselves one percent every single day, or is there is there a different strategy or you know five step program that could help? for salespeople to get in, all right, here's my routine. I know Monday through Friday is gonna be X and I'm just gonna follow it and I'm gonna use this as a measurement to continually improve and then 365 days from now I look back and I don't even know who that person was. Oh man, so much great stuff to, to uncover and unpack there. And I'm glad that you're talking about kind of the current state of the real estate world because we are going to address that. Um, Back to the self-awareness that we talked about in the beginning, there's a couple of things that, that each of us needs to know. And, and this is, I'm going to tie all of this together if it sounds like I'm going on a tangent. Uh, first is, um, I've known ever since I was a little child, I love early mornings. I mean, even when I was a little kid, I've just embraced early mornings. Now, I'm, 
uh, I'm not worth much when it comes to late at night. So I've learned in, in my life that I am of highest energy, of highest focus, and I'm the best version of myself earlier in the day. So because I'm also uh, unemployed every single morning when I wake up, unless I have a speaking engagement that day, um, you know, I, I understand that I have the ability and the flexibility to structure my own days. I get to create my own schedule because I'm self-employed. So I make sure that I take into account the fact that I'm better in the mornings than I am at night. So I, I front load my day. I literally and figuratively do my heavy lifting in the morning. So that's one thing that every person listening needs to figure out. Now, I know some people are wired the exact opposite. You know, they do better sleeping in in the morning and they're great as, as night owls. They do amazing work at 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night. That's fine. But each person needs to know that. Uh, the other thing that folks need to know is, and this surprises a lot of people because of what I do for a living, um, but I am heavily introverted. Um, I derive my energy in solitude. I love stillness. Now, I love people. I'm not antisocial by any means, but being with people drains me. I don't mean this to sound over dramatic. After this conversation is over, I will be emotionally drained. It will be like I just ran a marathon and all I'm doing is sitting here having a lovely discussion <laughs> with you folks, but pouring into others drains my battery. Now, it's, a, it's, it's very satisfying and there's no other thing I'd rather be doing to drain my battery, but I know that I have to balance speaking engagements and being a guest on podcasts and doing calls. I have to balance that with some alone time or some stillness or some solitude to recharge my battery. Other people are the opposite. My dad's the exact opposite. He gets energy from being around people and pouring into people. Uh, being in solitude drains him. So it's important that we know these things so that we can structure our lives around them. And then taking all of this into account, and this is really apropos to what we're talking about with the current state of the market, is I'm a huge believer in putting the vast majority of our focus, attention, and energy into the things we have control over yeah. and on some level, learning to let go of the things that we don't and the things that are outside of our control. This doesn't mean that they're not real. It doesn't mean that they're not valid. It just means that no matter how much you focus on them, it's not going to change. And you know, you just listed a, a very accurate list of what's going on in the economic, you know, climate at present you know, high interest rates, banks are failing, inflation, you know, and all of that stuff absolutely has an effect on the real estate market. But as an individual, you don't control any of those things. So the more time you spend anxious, worried, focused on the things outside of your control, it starts to detract from the things you do have control over. So while the economic climate may not be ideal, and it's certainly not preferred if you're in the business of selling homes, no matter how upset or stressed you get, it ain't going to change those things. So the only thing you can do is have the discipline and self-awareness to pour your attention and love into the things that you do have control over. And you can start planting those seeds now because at some point, the things outside of your control, they will improve. Absolutely, they will improve. Now, I certainly don't know if they'll improve in two months or two years. Uh, I don't know that anyone knows that but they will improve. That is the way that the world works. Anytime there's a dip, there's going to be, you know, a peak at some point. So the question is, are you making the deposits now and planting the seeds now so that when things do get better, you'll be better than ever? I mean, that's the only option we have. And, and I will say to anyone listening that is struggling at present, that is stressed out, that is worried about that, that is anxious, I have nothing but empathy and compassion for you. Uh, I'm not saying that this is easy. And I'm not saying that your feelings aren't valid. They most definitely are. But at some point, I would encourage you and hopefully try to nudge you towards not worrying about those things or focusing on them. You can be aware of them, but double down on the things you have control over. And our morning and evening routine, our personal self-care, our relationships, our ability to create and put out valuable content, like these are all things on our side of the fence that we can double down on. You know, as a speaker, you know, in full transparency, uh, January and February of this year were, were the two best months I've ever had as a speaker. These last couple months, March and coming into April, are a little bit slower. So my business is constantly ebbing and flowing. So when things are going great, wonderful. Now that things are a little bit slower for me, I'm doubling down on all of these things that I just shared. I'm taking this time to pour more into my self-care. I'm doubling down on creating and filming and writing new content to put out in the world. 
I'm reaching out and, and strengthening relationships with people. Like I'm making as many investments as I can. So my future self will have something to be thankful for. And that's really the mindset um, that, that I would encourage anyone in the real estate uh, game to be playing. I know that circumstances are not ideal, but you don't control the outer world. What you do have control over is how you respond in the inner world. And if you can have the discipline to double down on that now, I promise you, you will reap those benefits at some point. You just have to stay the course, stay consistent and, and have a belief that things will get better and they will. <laughs> Love it. I mean, I'm going to go back and re-listen to that part because that's, yeah. That I, I, you know, I'll share something with you. My brother passed away in October of 2021. And um, ever since then, I will wake up. It always happens from midnight to 2 a.m. And my mind goes into these um, really, really dark places. I'm like, how did I even get here? Right. So it's like it's like, it, you know, where I have to spend 30 minutes to an hour saying this isn't real. This isn't real. That that. I know I believe in myself that I can I can control what I can control and like you said the outside forces if I can't control that that needs to just that needs to go over over in that other bucket that's the out of control bucket I don't have any influence on and let's just focus on the stuff I can and it usually unfortunately takes me 30 minutes to an hour to get it back under control but I mean you know right now I know for as now. as business yeah for now as as I get better hopefully next year I'll say that's not happening at all, or maybe it's only five minutes. But um, I know that as people, as business owners, not just real estate agents, but as business owners that are having tough times, I know that this their mind is is one of their their biggest assets and biggest hindrance to mm -hmm. their success. And so I want you know hopefully people go back and listen to all of this, but even that that last part of just Control really just the controllables. Yeah. That was the best piece of overarching like mindset advice without having to get actually so granular and break anything down because it encompasses it all ultimately if people can just run like, with it and take with I, it. I I appreciate that immensely I'm glad it resonates and I'll, I'll take it a step further and also just so that you know um now I've never walked a day in the shoes of someone that's life is in real estate that that's not my area of expertise but I can say as a professional speaker on March 13th of 2020 I saw my entire speaker calendar get wiped off the map. My entire vocation in one fell swoop. I mean, and, and I won't lie, for 72 hours, I was panicked. For 72 hours, I was scared. Uh, I was anxious. It was a rough 72 hours. And I gave myself the space and the grace to feel that way. I didn't suppress how I was feeling. I didn't ignore it. I threw myself a massive pity party for 72 hours. <laughs> and then I realized, all right, this isn't going to help me. So what can I do? And then it clicked with me. You know, my entire business and everything I preach on stage and on page is about being of service to others and, and about leading with the heart. And I figured now's the time for me to do that. Even though I am not going to be able to speak in person, you know, talking about when the pandemic hit and I'm not going to be able to do my work the way I was used to, I can still be of value to others. I can still reach out and, and offer myself or support folks. You know, I remember that I wasn't the only person that was dealing with a global pandemic. There were a lot of people struggling and a lot of people hurting. And I wanted to make sure that I, you know, was able to, to, to lend a hand and to support and find ways to be of value. And same thing. If right now you're not able to sell homes at the same clip that you were selling when the market was better, you can still find ways to support and add value and plant seeds and strengthen relationships so that when things do get better, you are in prime position. And um, I'm very, very thankful that coming out of the pandemic, I mean, my, my speaking business skyrocketed. I mean, it was 10x what it was before the pandemic because for those 18 months, I was just planting seeds and it was yep. a tough 18 months, um, but you can build that type of grit and resilience. And a couple other things I'll share just about kind of this mindset. So for me, to me, mental toughness is acknowledging that all I can control is doing the best I can with what I have, wherever I am. That's it. Full stop. Every day when I wake up, I'm going to do the best I can with what I have, where I am. All of the outside circumstances and events, they're going to continually change. But nothing can prevent me from doing the best I can with what I have, wherever I am. And a, and a, a tear off of that is the reason I love that as a foundational mantra is it eliminates a trilogy of behaviors 
that undermines people's performance, undermines success, undermines fulfillment. I know these things firsthand and they're the automatic default for most human beings walking the earth. And that is blaming, complaining and making excuses. Yep. And there is never, especially in the real estate market, there has never been a greater time to fall to the temptation of blaming, complaining and making excuses. And to be crystal clear, because I don't want anyone to think I'm tone deaf, all of the things that uh, Nick, you just mentioned, the inflation, the, the banks collapsing, the uh, rising interest rates, those things are real. I'm not saying that they're not real. What I'm saying is blaming, complaining, and making excuses about them isn't going to help you sell any more houses and isn't going to help you be a better version of yourself. So to me, it's about letting go of the things that are holding us down and anchoring us down and focusing on the things we do have control over. And when you can do that, you become emotionally agile. And if you are not emotionally agile, you are emotionally fragile. And one thing I can promise you, when the economic times are less than preferred and things are tough, if you are, if you are emotionally fragile, you've got almost no chance to weather the storm. Yep. If you are emotionally agile, you can take anything the world throws at you and plant those seeds, focus on your self-care, um, forge the relationships and keep finding ways to be of service. Remember, you know, and I know I'm speaking to a very specific niche, but just keep in mind, selling homes is what you do. It's not who you are. Yep. Yep. When, the, when the outside world limits the number of homes you can sell, don't let it limit how you can contribute and add value to others. There's still other things that you can do. And also keep in mind that, that other people are going through this struggle. And if you can step up with some leadership and some fortitude during tough times, that's actually when you gain market share. You know, in any specific industry, when things are going great, everybody's reaping the benefits. When things are tough, that's actually when you can, you know, take steps forward and, and strides forward. And, you know, a, a perfect example was the hospitality industry. You know, I live in a suburb of, of Washington, D.C. I'm in, in Maryland. And uh, when everything shut down for the pandemic and, and all the restaurants closed, you know, the most successful restaurants today were the ones that were able to pivot back yep. in March and April of 2020. Yep. They found creative ways um, to, to, to allow folks to come pick up takeout food or to offer delivery when they didn't before. They found creative ways to change their menu. Like they were the ones that made the first wave of adaptions. Yep. Um, same thing with the grocery stores here. There's a grocery store chain here called Wegmans and yep. Wegmans did a vastly <laughs> superior job better than Whole Foods, better than Harris Teeter, better than Giant, better than Safeway. Well, let's, ease up, they, let's ease up on Whole Foods. Okay, uh, well, they saying. did a vastly <laughs> superior job in finding ways to safely let people come in and shop for groceries. And I can promise you, they're still reaping the benefits today of some of the tweaks and pivots they made in March of 2020. So for folks listening, if you're struggling now, have confidence and faith that if you're planting the right seeds and working on the right skill sets and mindsets now, at some point you are going to look back to this conversation and listening to this episode, and you're going to be so thankful you made those changes because you're going to absolutely be crushing it in the future. I think if a lot of people actually adopt a lot of what you're saying today, you can still have your best year in business yet this year. Yeah even with the market, even with banks collapsing, even with interest rates and uncertainty, like that is the beauty of what we do. I don't think a lot of people think that they can, but if you actually are consistent and take these right actions and protect your mindset, and once you get everything you covered in this, it can be this year. It doesn't even, you'll just continue to compound year over year, but like it is within you if you can pivot and do what you need to do every single day. It doesn't have yeah. to be delayed in the future. Absolutely. You know, back when I was in the, the exercise space, there's a few ways that you can you can measure progress. Let's just say in a typical workout, you know, you, you can increase the number of reps that you do. Uh, you can increase the weight that you do, or you can increase the, the, um, uh, the amount of work you do in a shorter time. So if you were used to doing, say, 15 exercises and it took you 30 minutes, if you can do the same sets and reps of those exercises, but you complete the workout in 25 minutes, it's actually a higher, a more intense workout. Like there's more benefit to that. And it's the same thing. So even if you just match what you sold last year, but you matched it and the, the economic climate is way worse this year than it was last year, that actually means you made progress. Yep. Like that is a huge win. 
So it's not just about topping what you did from a numeric value, even if you just come close to that. I mean, and, and all of this stuff that I'm preaching, I think there's a lot of alignment between being a keynote speaker and being in real estate. Um, it's, it's the same thing, you know? So even if you're not breaking your records, if you're able to come close to what you did before, despite all of these real tangible obstacles, that is a huge win and you should celebrate that and you should be very proud of that. And then once these constraints are taken off, once you take off this weight vest and take off these shackles, I mean, you are going to propel to levels that you've never even dreamed of before if you're willing to plant the seeds now. And back to the sports analogies, like I've seen this in basketball more times than I can count. Uh, a player enters the NBA and in their first several years, they're kind of a role player. You know, they don't get a lot of playing time, but they are in the gym every day, hour after hour. They're in the weight room. They're doing film sessions. They never quite get their chance. No one really knows who they are, but they're still putting in the work. And then they get traded to a team that has a slightly different dynamic and they're asked to play a few more minutes and boom, boom. they take off. And everything that they've been putting in during all the work they've put in during the unseen hours now comes to fruition. And, you know, I, I told you that I love quotes and all of these quotes that inspire me, none of them are by me. They're all by somebody else. Yeah. But, but one that I love is it's it's better to be prepared for an opportunity that never arises than unprepared for one that does. So I would say prepare right now as if the economic climate is going to get better in three months. And if it doesn't, that's okay. Then just continue preparing. And if it takes three years to get out of this mess, then just keep preparing. That's great but at advice. some point it's going to get better and you are going to be ready. The only thing, I mean, imagine three years from now, things get better and you've been doing nothing but twiddling your thumbs for three, three years Amazing. and you're not going to reap any benefits. So yeah. I know what I'm saying is very a matter of fact. I know that there's some people that are, are still scared and worried and anxious, people that might have to make some changes to their current spending habits and so forth. All of that is very real, but, but just focus on the things you have control over, have the discipline to stay in the, the game long term. And I'm telling you, you will remember this conversation and you'll be so grateful that you did. Real quick. First, I appreciate that, Alan, and, and thank you for your time. I mean, yeah. I mean, I know your time is very valuable. I have two more questions. Um, sure. One of them is going to be a sports questions. But before we get to that, how can people find you? Where can they get a copy of your book? Like, what's the best way to connect with you? My my website, alansteinjr.com, is kind of the main hub of everything. And, you know, um, I guess I'll say quite selfishly, I, I would love to get more involved in the real estate side from a speaking standpoint, because this message that I'm so appreciative for you to share on your platform, I think this is what folks in the real estate world need to hear right now. And it actually fills my cup to be the one to share that message. Like I want to help people when things are tough. Um, so if anyone is interested from a speaking standpoint, allensteinjr.com. Uh, I'm very active on social media and I take a lot of pride in being both accessible and responsive. So just follow at Alan Stein Jr. Uh, on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. If any part of this conversation resonated or if, if you want to ask a question, just shoot me a DM on Instagram or LinkedIn. I'm very good about getting back to people. And if anyone has an interest in either one of my books, uh, Raise Your Game uh, or Sustain Your Game, uh, you can find those on Amazon or Audible or wherever you get your books and audio books. But nothing fills my cup more than than when folks reach out after I've been on a show uh, and want to continue the discussion. So that's, this was so much fun and I've really enjoyed it. That's how we connected. I, I yeah. Elizabeth uh, on the Skinny Confidential. I listened to it. I was like, holy shit, this this is we speaking. We shared it with our whole team. We shared it with our sales team at the time. I said, guys, you need to listen. I was I was on the stairmaster, and I fired off an email. And then I heard something on there. You're like, you weren't really that great great at social media or, or, or something of that sort. I'm like, all right, send him an email. Um, but then I'm going to just go ahead and DM on Instagram. And then we just started that conversation. So you're, you're definitely very accessible. So I appreciate that. So the two questions, and I'm stealing one from Elizabeth. She had a whole list here, um, <laughs> is, is uh, what gets you out of bed in the morning? Being of service to others. Like my, my goal is just to fill people's cups. So I, I've said this on some other podcasts and just add this to the long list of quotes that I use but have no idea who said them originally. Um, is a candle loses nothing by lighting another candle. And, and I believe that ultimately my job and my purpose is to light other people's candles. And sometimes I do that on stage at a keynote. 
Sometimes I do that by what I write in a book that someone reads. Sometimes I do that when someone's kind enough to let me have their platform and, and be on their podcast. But I wake up every day with the goal to light people's candles. And uh, sometimes that those candles are just my own three children. And that's the only thing that I'm worried about for that day. But that's ultimately what motivates me is can I light other people's candles? Awesome. Love it. And then the last question is, I love that, I love that. sorry, I love that because I was just thinking in my head, just like the, uh, we talked about going to extremes before and that, I, that is so true. I love that. I love the idea of, of getting up in service for others and just this goofy thought about like, uh, David Goggins interview he's like I get up to put people's candles out or something like that <laughs> like somebody saying something like that <laughs> it's so funny uh, um, <laughs> that's, that's, a, that, that's something you that. would say yes, that would be yes I definitely can see that so at the end of our show Alan what we do is normally when we don't have a guest we ask some ridiculous hypothetical right it goes off the rails yeah. and so so we were we were looking at we were kind of searching for one but at the same time um, we, Brian, obviously he will, he will just randomly interrupt and, and have this, this thought. Mm -hmm. And at one point he was like, all right, if you had to pick one, right. And, and I'm going to let it's you gotta do it. It's got to be the largest stage. Okay. You want me to do it? Yep, go ahead. Okay. This is a good one. We've done this one before. I think we actually tested it. We tested most of it and they're all tough in their own way. You've got to be on the largest stage. So whatever the largest stage means to you, would you rather have to hit a free throw a 30-yard field goal, you got to get on base and there's a 2-1 count, or you got to make a six-foot putt. But it was because, look, he's a basketball guy, so we've got we've to even elevate that stage. Okay. So it's got to be in the finals, game seven. Yeah, like whatever you can imagine. It's got to be finals, game seven. Tied up. It's tied up. No, no, no. How about this? It's not tied up. You're only sending it to overtime. Uh, you miss it, you lose. Yes, even better. Because if you miss it and you're tied up, there's like no harm, no foul. You're yeah. down by one. Right, and you've well, got two one count, got to get on base, World Series, right? Free throw, down by one. Hockey, hockey. How? Oh, uh, no, no. Soccer was you got to hit a penalty kick in the in the finals <laughs> of the World Cup, make a six foot putt at the Masters to win it, or uh, what was the other? Or uh, no, I think that was it. It was, it was field goal. Oh, field goal. It was, uh, free throw. Yeah. It was field goal, kick, three throw, penalty kick, putt. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, got to choose one. Well, based on my background, I would automatically take the, the free throw because it's the only of those five that I have any decent level of competence. But, but let me, I want to unpack this because I love, I think this yeah. is a brilliant question. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the difference between an open loop and a closed loop skill. Uh, okay. An open loop skill means the environment is changing and you have other factors to depend on. A closed loop skill means that basically it's preset and, and it's it's up to you to start and stop and perform the skill. Generally speaking, closed loop skills are easier because you don't have anything else to worry about. So yes, I realize the fans behind the basket can be waving their hands, but right. the basket is the same height, the free throw line is the same distance, the ball is the same size and weight. Yeah. Me shooting a free throw to, to tie the game or lose, uh, is no different than if I was doing that in a gym by myself. So I have a little bit more control over my own destiny. Same thing in theory with a golf putt. Um, the others, now I'm required to hit a pitch thrown by someone else, yep. or I need yeah. to be able to pick a field goal based on someone else snapping it and catching it and making sure the, the laces are out. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. There's, there's it other was Einhorn. Factors. Einhorn is Finkel. Einhorn is Finkel, exactly. Now there's a great reference right there. Um, and, and even, even you know, if I'm trying to throw a touchdown or anything, I'm dependent on others. Um, so I'll always take the closed loop skill if you're asking what it is that I need to do. But on a breakdown. bigger level, yeah. if you're asking me personally what I think the hardest skill in sports is, it would be hitting a curveball. Oh, I've absolutely. Never baseball. Yeah. I think hitting a 90 mile an hour curveball might be the hardest skill in all of sports. Uh, and I say that with massive respect to every sport. And and don't even get me started on hockey because I can't even skate. So I wouldn't say that. I'd be out on that one to begin with. Upright. So, um, yeah. So I'll take free throw for myself, but I would even take putt as number two just because yeah. I have more control over that. That is the first time anybody has actionably turned our stupid hypothetical question yes. into an actual lesson. Good so you are now in the, the tour hall of fame. I think <laughs> we, we had, and I love the, the breakdown. We had a long thing about, about the 2-1 count. My only defense was that 
you got a chance to get walked because it's a two-one count. If it was a full count, I'm out all day. I don't want it to come down to one pitch. So I agree with you. But yeah, I mean, you get you know, Lester and Nestor Cortez up there. That's an open loop all day. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, and gives us a strong appreciation to what what athletes really go go through. And uh, but you know what, the the great ones, all of those scenarios that you just laid out, what makes them great is the fact that they actually view that as an opportunity. Yep. They they are thankful for an opportunity. I have a chance to hit the game winning, you know, hit yep. or home run or hit the game winning free throw or kick the game winning field goal. I have a chance. It is in my hands now for us to be successful and there is no one in the world that I'd rather do this than me because I've put in the work during the unseen hours to deserve the right to make this happen. It, so where many of us many mere mortals would would cringe at the thought and, and be suffocated by the pressure they're like oh heck yeah i can't believe i get a chance to you, do this Give bro, me that i love you you gotta go look and then we'll, we'll try to wrap with this is it is it who's the Bengals kicker is it harrison butker somebody I can't remember. regardless you do like the nfl mic'd up or whatever yeah the the year that the Bengals lot two years ago when they lost to the 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 rams in the super bowl when they were going to the afc championship in the divisional round they had a walk-off field goal opportunity and there's a nfl mic'd up blurb where the kicker walks onto the field and passes joe burr and he goes and the kicker this is the kicker who's about to go kick the field goal not joe burrow this is the kicker telling joe burrow he goes Guess we're going to the AFC Championship and just walks off and Stone Cold hits like a 52 yarder. Like, nothing. I was like, that's an unreal mindset. Like, no fear, just so excited that he gets to be the guy that sends him to the AFC Championship. That is cold blooded. That is definitely Stone Cold. <laughs> love it. Love it. All right. Alan, thank you again so much. You can go to allensteinjr.com. We'll put it in the comments. It'll be in the show notes. Um, and go buy his books. I mean, he's got he's got books there. You reach out to him, ask him questions. Um, definitely very accessible. That's how I reached out to him. Alan, I'm going to make a commitment to you. I'm going to connect you with with Glenn. Uh, Glenn Sanford at EXP is the co-founder. Uh, he's the founder of EXP. Um, we definitely want to see if there's a way we can get you on, yep. on the Jay EXP Mike. Realty stage for a keynote side. So I'm going to make... You gave us and great and blessed us with your time. I'm going to try to do something and, and help you out on that. Hey, one last thing. Don't you guys answer it because I know you know the answer. But the first person on Instagram to DM me the movie from Einhorn is Finkel or Finkel is Einhorn. I'll send I'll send a free book to you. Just send me the movie. Oh, nice. Oh, cool. first, that is bad. First one in my DM, but uh, absolute classic. And, and I actually may watch that tonight before I go to bed. Because now yeah, I'm I, I might watch that tonight. Have to now. <laughs> yep. Movie night for all of us. <laughs> <Yes>. Alan, <laughs> Alan, thank you so much, man. You guys head over to Instagram. Find him, Alan Stein. Man, it's fantastic. I appreciate it. Alan, you. just hold on one minute after the show, please. Absolutely. Sure Jesse, get us out of here. <laughs> appreciate it.